Hello everyone and welcome to episode 27 of our Raspberry Pi series and in today's episode we're going to be installing Motion iOS on our Raspberry Pi. Now I've decided to go from scratch with our installation today um, instead of using a Docker container. This is because Motion iOS is quite resource intensive and if you guys are using a Docker container it could really slow down the whole Pi um, and other Docker containers and other containers that are actually using the Raspberry Pi's hardware. So the reason why it gets quite resource hungry is because it is recording um, video feeds and it's converting them into a video format. Now that takes quite a lot of resources to do so. So I use Motion iOS daily. I have four cameras in and around my office and um, I've been using these for about four or five years. So I've had plenty of experience with Motion iOS and the interface and how to configure it and get it to work um, in the way that I needed it and intended to. Now every area that you put a camera in will have different needs so you can tweak the camera to have certain sensitivity with the motion detection and other things which I'll show you later on when we get into the interface. I have set up a Patreon account for Addicted to Tech. If you guys want to become a supporting member you can do. I will be adding different memberships in due course and with different features and maybe some early access as well as some merch. If you guys are interested in any of that, please take a look at our Patreon. There's a link in the description. As a supporting member, we'll be giving a shout out at the end of every single episode um, to all our patrons to say thank you for being a support of this channel. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at Motion iOS. I'm going to go across to my computer. So this is Motion iOS and it comes from a developer called Christian. I hope I haven't murdered your name. This is where you will find all the files that are required to install it on your Raspberry Pi. So Motion iOS is built up of several different components. It is based on the Motion package and it, the interface itself is called Motion i. Motion iOS is just the operating system that you're going to install onto your Raspberry Pi. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how to download it first of all. So I have a separate article here, there will be a link in the description below to show you which release to get and obviously we'll go through this today. So the first thing we're going to do is download Motion iOS. So we're going to come down to where it says here on step one and we'll click on here which will take us to the releases page. Now we're not wanting the pre-release, we want to go down to the latest release and look for the device that you are installing on and I'm installing it on the Raspberry Pi 3. So I'm going to come down to here. I'm going to click on that and download it. Now it says that it has an img.xy. So we're just going to click save. So we're going to need to decompress that. Um, so we need to go to, to a site called Banzip. And there's a free decompressor here that you can use. Um, if you guys use your own zip archiver, you can use that as well. But this is free and I use Banzip for quite a few years and I know it's a good product. And we have downloaded it. So we're going to install that first. Untick automatically send user statistics and crash reports and then click on agree and install. Okay, now click close when it's done. So now we have Banzip installed. It will give you a little associations block. Just click apply now and then okay. And it that is the archive there, that's what it looks like, but we're not going to use it like that. So we're just going to press X on that now. Now if we go into our downloads folder and we click on here and it opens up. Now you can see that we have this Motion Eye OS Raspberry Pi 3 image. Okay, and you can see that it is zipped in an XY format. I want to make sure that we are installing the correct image. If we install this um, XY file, it could cause some problems. So I always make sure that I extract the image from here. So what you want to do is right click on here and then click Extract to Motion I um, OS Raspberry Pi 3 and that will extract it into its own folder and then we click this folder now and go in and we now have our image file here. Now that is the image file, disk image that I would um, use to install it onto your SD card. Now I'm going to use a um, software called Raspberry Pi Imager. You guys can use um, Etcher if you want to use stuff like that but Raspberry Pi Imager, it, to me, is what I use for all Raspberry Pi installations. It's the official um, Raspberry Pi supported um, writer to SD cards. So we're going to go to the Raspberry Pi website. There will be a link in the description again. There will be a section here which says install Raspberry Pi OS using Raspberry Pi Imager. So we're going to click on download for Windows and we're going to click save file. And then go to downloads folder again and you'll see that it is here, Imager. And we're going to double click on it. Now I already have it installed, so I'm just going to update it and click on yes and install. 
So where it says run Raspberry Pi Imager, you can just untick that box and then click finish. With Raspberry Pi Imager, it has preset images in there, so you can actually just click on it and click and install. You don't have to download them from different sources. So because we're using a custom image, we can come into this folder now, and here is our Raspberry Pi 3 image. We're going to right click it, and we're going to click on open with, and then Raspberry Pi Imager, and then click yes. So to attach an SD card to your computer, if you don't have an SD card slot, you can use an SD card adapter like this one here. It has a SD card um, adapter with a micro SD card inside that. So basically it's an adapter inside an adapter. So the micro SD card goes into the um, SD card adapter. And so that goes into the USB adapter on the side here. And then this goes into your USB port on your computer. And that will allow you to write the image to the micro SD card. So I'm going to insert my USB adapter now into my USB 3.0 port. And as you can see, it's come up here now saying that you need to format the disk. You just click cancel on that now. And if you go to PC, you should see that your USB drive appears. Now that's not the full size because it's got a partition on it. That's obviously the boot drive. So what we're going to do now is we're going to choose the storage device, which is here. And we're going to click on write. And we're going to click yes. So the good thing about Raspberry Pi Imager is it will verify the image once it's done as well. Um, and also it will eject the SD card safely, ready for you to remove it from your machine. See, it says you can now remove the SD card from the reader. So that's me done. So I can pull that from my machine now. And I'm going to click continue. So we can cross out of that now. So we're just going to take a look at the recommended parts for today's episode. And we have a Raspberry Pi, which is a Raspberry Pi 3, which should be sufficient enough to run Motion iOS. And we have a um, Raspberry Pi official um, power supply for the Raspberry Pi 3. We have a USB 3.0 drive. And the reason why I suggest using this is to write all the video files to it. So you put that into the USB slot. And when Motion Eye picks up any detections and starts recording video, it will save it to the USB stick. Next up, we have a micro SD card. I use a 16 gigabyte card, which is sufficient enough for Motion iOS. You're not storing any video files on there, so it would just be for the operating system. So the camera that I recommend to use is this camera here that you can get off of Amazon. This is an affiliate link, so if you guys use that link, I do get a little bit of small commission back. It comes at no extra cost to you. So this camera is a one megapixel camera, and it supports a resolution up to 720p. I use um, four of these cameras in and around my office. They work flawlessly. If you guys want to go a little bit higher res, I have actually given you a couple of links here to the higher res um, camera, which is actually 1080p. And it's a two megapixel camera, that one. So there's a couple of links here. As I said, the for just general use, this 720p camera is absolutely perfect. It has night vision. It works at a good range around the office that here, and it can see right out to the car park with the night vision. So, I mean, I can't give you the exact range, but that's it, it works sufficient for my needs, and I've never needed to um, up it in any shape or form. Now, the only thing that you may find with the lower res one is at night time, when the night vision kicks in, it may get a little bit grainy. As it, Again, if you want a little bit more um, you know, detail in that, you can um, obviously go for the 1080p. I also have a Cat5e Ethernet cable here, which I use to hardwire my camera straight into my router or my switch. So now that we've downloaded the image and have it on our SD card, you need to put your SD card into your Raspberry Pi, which you can slot into the underneath of your Raspberry Pi. You will then need to attach your USB devices to your Raspberry Pi. So you can put your camera into one of the USB ports, and it doesn't matter which one you use, they all are 2.0, and put your flash drive into the other one. And now you want to put in your power supply into the side of your Raspberry Pi. And finally, if you're using your Ethernet cable, you will need to put that into this slot. So once you have everything inserted, you just need to put your internet cable into your router and then put your power supply into the wall. And then once you press the power on, your Raspberry Pi should start to boot. So now the next step is you need to find out what your Raspberry Pi's IP address. If you look in the description below, you will see a link to the blog post for the specific episode today. And I'll have all the information and images that you can follow along with there. So if you come down to step three on that page, you will see that there is a, we have a article here, which will show you how to find your IP address 
on your local network. So you'll need to know your IP address of your Raspberry Pi. So once you've found your Raspberry Pi's IP address, what you need to do is we need to put it into the address bar. So this should load up your camera feed now automatically. Now we are logged in as user mode right now, which means we can't access the settings or anything like that. So the camera feed, as you can see, is working correctly. There is some lag and delay in the response time. Um, this is due to the resolution that it's on and as well as the frames per second feed, which we will now go into the settings and configure it to work. So Motion iOS supports two different user accounts. You have the admin account and a user account. Now the user account is used so that you can pass these details on to a third party or you can use it in software that's untrusted. Um, basically you can view cameras on there. You can still secure it so that a user can access it but they cannot delete any files off the, um, the camera on the, and they cannot access any of the settings. So it's just an extra security measure. So we're gonna click on this icon here and we're gonna log in as admin. And we're gonna click on remember me and then log in. So we now have admin access to our camera. So if you click on the hamburger menu now in the top left hand corner, this will give you your settings. So I'm gonna start from the top and I'm gonna work my way down. So I'm gonna put this on one, so this give you a larger view of the video. And we're gonna leave everything in that section the way it is. Now as I explained earlier, there's two user accounts, there's admin and user. You wanna put a password for each. So obviously if you're using the user account and letting somebody else use this device and you don't want them to access any of them extra settings, you wanna make sure that these passwords are different. So we're gonna set a password for the admin account and we're gonna set a password for the user account. Now we're gonna change the time zone. I am in Europe, London, so I need to look for that. And host name means what you want your host name to be of your whole Raspberry Pi. This will show up on the network as its network name. So I'm gonna call this Office CCTV. Um, here in this next section here, you can check for any updates. So if you guys need to update your Raspberry Pi at any time, you need to just click on check from here. So here you've got the power options, you can shut it down and you can reboot. You can also back up your configuration settings and you can restore them from here, which is handy. The next section here is network. So if you want to enable wireless, you can just click on on. You need to put in your network name and your network key. And then once you apply this, you'll then be able to connect to it wirelessly. I don't recommend using wireless, I'd rather hardware it, but obviously in some circumstances with cameras being high up on buildings, wireless might be a better option, um, more convenient option, but it's not always the most secure. Um, this is why I prefer to hardwire my camera using Ethernet cables to make sure that that gives it just an extra layer of security. In this next section here, it says IP configuration and it says DHCP, that's fine, that means it will get an IP address from your router and you don't have to set it statically. I do recommend setting a static IP address. If you know how to do that, then do it by all means. You just click on here and then add a static IP address to this. Um, I use a static IP address so it can be found at all times. If you reset your router or you reset your camera, it could then grab another IP address and you won't be able to find it. You'll have to go back through trying to find your IP address again. So setting a um, static IP address is, is definitely recommended there. Um, you also need to set it up on your router. Next section here is services, we're gonna click on here. Now I don't recommend having any of these enabled um, for security reasons. You don't want an FTP server, you don't want to have sandbar, and you don't want to have your SSH connected. The only time you should enable SSH is if you want to go in and update the operating system, you can, you can connect to it via PuTTY. Um, I've shown you that in previous episodes. If you go through the um, Raspberry Pi series, you will see how to do that. So um, I would definitely recommend just turning that off. Now when you run the check for the new software, it should automatically grab all the new pack packages for the whole operating system. You shouldn't need to SSH into your device. You should only SSH in if you need to problem solve something or that you know there's a reason to do that. So with them all turned off, that's great. Expert settings, wouldn't change anything in here unless you have any specific reason to. Um, sometimes you might wanna change your NTP server to um, a HTTP proxy or something like that. Um, completely up to you. Um, all these in here, I'll just leave exactly the way they are. Um, let's go into the next section, which is video device. Now, the most important part in here is the video resolution. Um, you can tweak all the settings in here. So the USB camera that I chose from Amazon, 
This one has automatic sort of adjustments. It'll adjust the focus and the lighting and you don't really need to set these on in here. So I'd come down here to where it says video resolution and you click on here and as I said, it's a 720p camera. If you guys went for the high resolution, you would use the 1080p. So that's the highest resolution that this camera supports. And then we're going to up the frame rate to 30 frames per second. Um, and that is so that we can record and see things in the back. I mean, at the moment you can see there's delay. That's because that's set at one frame a second. So you're only getting one frame per second coming through through the feed. So we're going to scroll down now to the next section, which is file storage. So we inserted a flash drive into our Raspberry Pi. I recommend using a flash drive or even a USB drive, but you may need to use a USB hub that's powered from the mains. I have some recommendations below as well as on our website. So if you keep writing data to a SD card, it has a high failure rate. You don't want to be dumping your video footage onto there. Not only that, it will fill up pretty quickly and it could stop your whole operating system from working and you just don't want that to happen. So we want our storage to go onto our flash drive. We're going to click on here and you can see it's listed here, SanDisk Cruiser. We'll click on that and then you can give it a folder which you can name CCTV, etc. I'm going to call mine CCTV2. If you look at the disk usage here, it will tell you what space you have left on you, your flash drive and it will let you know if it's getting too full. Um, you want to keep an eye on this to make sure that there's plenty of space for you to store your video footage. If this fills up, then obviously it's not going to record anything else onto your drive. There is some settings that you can do late, later on where it will store a specific amount and we can put some extra settings on that to make sure that it deletes files um, it periodically to make sure that there's space, which is another good um, feature of Motion iOS. So we're going to move down the line here and we're going to look at this next section which is upload media files. Now this allows you, once they've recorded, they can up be uploaded to cloud storage if you guys want to use that. Under here you can turn it on. So you, all you do is you go down to where it says upload service and you can select which Google Drive or Google Photo or Dropbox service that you wish to use. You can also use an FTP server or an SFTP server which is um, over SSH. I'm not going to go through the specifics of enabling any cloud services. Um, I may do that in a later episode. So for now, I'm just going to turn off upload media files. We just want that we don't want them to go to the cloud anyway for extra security. This is a private system that we're building today. We just want all of our video footage to go onto the USB stick so we can keep it private. So call a webhook means that you can add a webhook into there so that once it runs, it then run a specific webhook. It can notify you. It can also um, work with um, Home Assistant and things like that. Um, at the end of it, you can also run a command. So you can put a command in there to run on your Raspberry Pi. This is all advanced stuff which we could look at at a later date. If you guys are interested in any of this stuff, please let me know and I can do a separate video for it. So we're going to come down the line. The text overlay. Now this is to do with what you see inside your camera. You can see it says camera one and it says that's the, um, the date and the times on there. So you can select what you want on the left and on the right hand side. So camera name is fine. The only thing I would suggest with these is maybe making it a little bit bigger if you fancy it, just so it comes up bigger on the feed. That's what you, you need to do. So when the camera is recording, you can see these clearer. So we're going to come down the line here to video streaming. Um, we want our streaming rate to be at 30 frames a second. The streaming quality is around 75, so about 85 is fine. I'd leave that as default. I wouldn't touch that. Streaming image resizing, I wouldn't touch any of that. Now streaming port. Now this is if you just want to access the camera. Um, not using the interface. So if you want to feed this into something else, you can do. So it's on port 8081. So you, what you do is you take this IP address and you pop it in there. And then at the end, you'll put the um, the port number, which was 8081. And what you'll see come back is just a feed of your camera. You can see it there. It's at, at the lower resolution because I haven't saved the settings. Now, this can be viewed by anyone. So anyone has that IP address, they can view this currently. We don't want this to just be open for everyone to see it. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on authentication mode and we're just going to click on basic. Okay. So what that means, when you come to um, view on port 8081, you will need to put in the um, admin or the user credentials that we have set before to access the camera through the um, through that feed. But you can feed these feeds into any third party software. That's the, that's the whole reason why it has it. Um, motion eye optimization. You can click on on if you want. You know, I'm just I wouldn't I wouldn't bother. I'll just leave it leave it setting because we're going to go into the further settings down here and tweak it the way we want it. So still images. I don't really need to have that on. I'll just turn that off. 
We're using it for um, video footage, so we're not really interested in images. Movies, we want to turn on. And this will give you the file names that you want to give your files, which these are fine. Um, I'd leave these exactly the way they are. I wouldn't touch anything here. Uh, motion triggered, yes, please. Maximum movie length, zero. So I'll just leave that the way it is. And preserve movies. Now, this is where you can set a time limit. So what happens after a certain period of time, it will remove um, any any older, older footage. So I like to set mine for a week. And it will tell you here that we will recursively remove all old media files present in the directory. And that's the directory I set, not just those created by MotionEye. Okay, so everything in that directory that's older than one week will be removed. Now, one week, you can, you can up this depending on how long you need to um, save that footage. Some companies may need to store it longer. You know, you can store up to a month and you can even store up to a year, which is crazy. But if you've got a big enough storage device, you can store that on there. So the next section is the detection, the motion detection. And um, the most important thing in here really is this frame change threshold. Now, depending on where your camera is positioned, okay, every environment is different. So you need to tweak this specifically for each camera to make sure that you're getting the optimal settings. You're gonna, it's trial and error, you're gonna need to keep coming back, keep checking, keep testing, keep checking. So you'd have to go in front of the camera, test the different scenarios, coming in front of it, moving it, moving a car, things like that, and keep coming in and tweaking it so you get the optimal settings. And as I said, every camera is different. So one, one thing that can help you with this frame change threshold is to set up the show frame changes down here. I'll show you later on why that is significant and why that will help you set up the correct threshold frame rate. So the lower this threshold is on the frame change, the um, the more sensitive the camera is going to be to movement. So we're just going to go down a little bit further. Maximum change threshold, I'd leave all that the same. Auto noise detection is good. Light switch detection, you can turn on if you have sort of light changing in different environments like um, the sun coming out, the sun changing at different times of day, clouds going in and out underneath the sun, changing the light on and off. So you can tweak that. The despeckle filter basically puts a filter over the top of the image and it also helps with just honing down on that frame rate and getting that motion just correct. So if, if something's moving all the time, like a, um, a bush or some leaves or things like that, this can really help stop it from it keep setting off the camera all the time. So leave the motion gap at 30. I think that's just in between different um, recordings. So it'll set between, how long after one recording would another recording start. The capture before and after is, is another good thing to keep extending that recording going a little bit after that motion has been captured. So when the car's gone or the person's gone from the frames and it, the, the motion stopped, this will continue to record for whatever you set here afterwards so that's that's pretty good the minimum motion frames is how many frames have to move before the motion is detected so you can set that as well here um, it's up to you a mask is really quite an interesting thing I've set this on a couple of my cameras because some of my cameras I have bushes and trees that are there you don't want to if them trees are moving constantly triggering the camera you can click on the mask from here a smart mask will automatically detect them trees that the um, the, the trees won't keep setting off the camera, the motion, and setting off the recording all the time. The smart one is quite good because the algorithms inside the camera will keep noticing that section that's moving. So if the trees and the bushes keep moving continuously over and over again, the smart will pick that, the smart detection will pick that up and it will say, well, that area is moving all the time. And the algorithm will say, right, we'll dis disregard that movement there and we'll look elsewhere. You can also edit this yourself, which is which is brilliant. I love this is one setting I love. You can click on Edit Mask. Now, obviously here, let's say I I didn't want it set my 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 motion. Let's say I just wanted my movement to set it off here. So where I am now, I wanted just that to set it off. I don't want any of my lighting and my, my computer to set off the motion. So you can actually just select the area, the frames here. You can set them up so that none of this area, none of my screen here on my computer or my computer itself will set off motion, okay? So I can just set that right there and say, and also my lights, I didn't want to set off the motion. I can just select them like that, set all them frames, and now any movement on my screen or any movement with my light, change of lighting, obviously if the lighting affects this area, it will set that off, but if it's any changing with this, with, with my screen, it won't set off the motion, um, which is really cool. So you can save that, um, you know, but to be honest with you, in my experience, the smart is really good. The smart will do what you need it to do. 
Um, if you find that it's not quite hitting enough, you know, hitting it on the head, it's not quite getting it accurate enough, you can fine tune it with editable. And also you can set this sluggishness, which I find quite a funny word to put there, but you can set this, this on to say how often and frequently it will um, take that area that you've selected and um, how it will re refresh it and say, well, is that area still um, movement? Is there still movement in that area? Should we still say that um, we're not gonna look there? It, it keeps looking at it all the time and seeing whether it should, should start it or not um, and start blocking that area. So if you had a tree there and you removed the tree, under that there, it will keep having a look and eventually it'll notice that tree's gone and then it'll start to try and detect motion in that area. I hope you get that in there. Um, show you frame rate changes, as I said, we're gonna turn that on. That's gonna help fine tune this um, change threshold here. Um, motion notific notification, so you can get this to send an email to you once it notices any um, um, motion, uh, which is good. If you wanna send an email, you're gonna need to use an SMTP server and your um, also your your camera is also going to have to have outside access, so it's going to have to have um, internet access, um, so that it can call out to an SMTP server to send that email. You can have it call a webhook. It can run a command, so you can have it run something in the background, which sends it across to it whatever you want. You can set any command that you want to run in there, and you can run an end command once it's finished. The final section down here is a working schedule. Now, as you can see, this camera up here is in my office. So let's say I didn't I working here set hours. Uh, nine to five. I don't want my camera to be triggered whilst I'm sitting in my office. Now you can set a schedule here for every day. So say I'm working from nine to five. You can set this here nine to five. Okay, and you can set that for each day. It has it in? You can have different times for different days if you've got different shifts. Um, I'm just going to do two days. I think I've set that to five a.m. So I'm going to change that. Um, you set that to five and set that on to five. Okay, and then what you do is during working schedule, so you want to detect motion, no, we want to do it outside of working schedule. So once these, outside of these hours, okay, this camera this camera will ignore any motion within that set period. And then after the outside working hours, it will then detect the motion. So that's good if you're in an office and you want to leave and come back later on. Now once you've set up all these settings, you can click on apply, and then it will reboot the system. You click yes, that's fine and you just wait for that to reboot. Now you may hear some clicking of the camera as it reboots, that's just, that's what the camera makes a little click noise when it powers off and powers back on. So as you can see it has a new camera name on there, which is what we want to see. So we're going to log in with admin, and then obviously the new credentials that you set, and then click on remember me, and then click login. You can save it in your browser if you want to, I just said not save, thank you. And there you are. And as you can see now, the camera worked a lot better. It's working in pretty much re retarget. I mean, there's a little bit of lag in there, but it's working much better. And the resolution is higher, and it's great. And the last thing you'll notice is because I set that time, that working schedule, see, it's not recording. When it records, you get this red section that comes right around, right around the camera. So as you can see up here on, in the top right-hand corner, there is no motion that's been detected because we have disabled it under the, that working schedule before because it's on, it's actually Monday when I'm recording, so it's off. So if we click back on here, and I'm going to go back down to the working settings because I need to show you a few more things, and I'm just going to turn off the working schedule for now. Click apply. And what you should see instantly now is you should see some motion. Now, if you look here, we set before that we, um, under under here. So if we scroll down to text overlay, now this one that we set is too small. So we need to we need to up this. So let's try three. And there you are. This this is now big enough to be seen. Before this 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 text was really small when it was set to one. So set it to about three. You don't have to reboot when you change settings like that. It's only really resolution settings or host name or things like that that's going to cause problems. But if you look up here now, you can see see that what I was saying before about this detection. So the setting that we turned on down here under motion detection, and we turned on the show frame changes. Now the good thing with that is it's shown us up here where it's been detected. So if I move now, you'll see that will go up. And if I, if I stay still, 
it will go down. And it also gives you this red box to show you where there is detection, okay? This will always show you where something's moved. Now use these, use this now to really fine tune where you want this this motion to be triggered. And you can do, you literally can do that by keep going back into the, the settings. Come down to motion detection. And if, if, it's, if it's setting off all the time or not enough, you can just tweak this. Now I find putting this quite low, I have to put this right down to like 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Around there is kind of like the sweet spot. And that will that will detect motion, but not little things like a bird or or something flying past or something moving quickly. It won't detect that. But something that comes in for a few frames, then it'll start detecting that motion. And as I said, you can you can spend you can spend hours in here really tweaking this camera and getting it set up correctly. So the last thing I want to show you is the hidden options, which you have to click on the actual um, camera itself to enable. And then once that comes up, you can click here. So we can expand it so that it's full screen, which is helpful if you're using a monitor to record um, you know, one camera feed. You can put that on full feed and have that on the monitor so you can see everything. Um, here is any images that you take. I don't use images. I just use videos. The play button here will show you the videos it's recorded. And these will show you along here will show you the date. So this will go right down in date order. And you can from here, you can click on it and you can watch the video. You can go full screen, and this was me talking before. And as you can see there, I'm moving around, so that's what it picked up. And you can click close on that. You can delete from here, and you can download that to the device that you're viewing on. So obviously, if you're also viewing this on your phone, you can download it from there as well. And this last little button here will just take you to the settings where we were before. Now, another thing that you can do in, in Motion iOS, and the last thing I will say is you can actually add other cameras. Now, if you're using, I would recommend doing this on the Raspberry Pi 3, but if you have a Raspberry Pi 4, this should work. It should, I mean, I haven't tested, but I'm pretty sure it will work fine. If you have more than one Motion iOS camera in your house, um, you can connect that to one device, so you can view it through one device. Um, it, what that means is that from here, if you click on this button here, and you click on this here and click add camera. So under here, you can actually ca add another motion eye camera. So you have a remote eye motion eye camera. You put in the, um, the URL. So you'd put in the URL in here. And then you would put an admin password for it that you set. And that's how you'd get in. And then once you do that, it will add another camera to this feed. You'd put layout columns, columns you'd put two and you'd have two cameras in here. Now, the only problem I have with that is that it, what that's got to do then is put an extra strain on that Raspberry Pi that you're using. This is why it wouldn't work with a Raspberry Pi 3, because the Raspberry Pi 3 would have to not only feed that one camera, it will also have to grab the other camera from the other Motion Eye and feed that through too. So it's doing double the work, basically, and um, it's putting a lot of strain on the resources of that device. A Raspberry Pi 4 should be able to do it fine. They should, you should have no problems. I mean, that's like desktop power. So, um, you know, you can do that. But So if you wanted to have one hub, a Raspberry Pi 4 hub, where you just went to that one address, like here, for instance, and in there you'd have all your other cameras listed in there, you can do that as well. Um, but as I said, with a Raspberry Pi 3, I definitely wouldn't recommend doing that. A Raspberry Pi 3 will be a single camera, a single feed. So the final thing I want to show you is Motion iOS has an Android app and you can view your cameras on your devices, on your Android devices, so your tablet or your phone. So we're just going to search for Motion iOS, Motion, sorry, Motion i. Click on that and then you can see it has a Motion i app. We're going to click install and we're going to open it. You can click allow to this. This just means that you can download the files from it to your device. So we're going to add our first camera. It's our only camera that we've done today. So we're going to add our IP address. So you've got to put HTTP forward forward slash and then 192.168 minus 2.214. So whatever your Raspberry Pi IP address is, put it in there. We don't need the port. I'm just going to put a device label. So I'm going to call this Office CCTV. And I'm going to click Save. And then we need to put in our credentials that we set before. So it's admin. And then we're going to click on. And then we're going to click login. 
Okie doke. And there you are. So this will work from your Android device. And you can watch the feeds from here. And you can do everything that you did before. You can play any footage from there. So that will work straight through, through, your, through your device. And you can also download to, to your device. So it's downloading it. And you can delete it from it. You can even set up all the settings. Everything, you get the full interface through your Android device. So as you can see, Motion iOS is a great bit of software. It's free and open source. It also allows you to set up a private camera system. So most of the cameras that you buy nowadays, they are linked to the cloud. So all your personal private information is being shared with some third party. Now the glory of this system that you make, it keeps it completely private. It's only you that has access to them files and you can secure it as much as you want. There is one final step that you can make to secure your Motion iOS. If you have a router that is compatible with parental controls, you can set up a, um, a parental control on that device to basically block the internet access on there at all times. What this means is that Motion iOS cannot connect to the internet. Um, if you are just viewing your cameras from within your home, then you will be able to see that. By doing that, it just gives it an extra level of security. It means that if any hacker gets into your system or anything like that, it can't install software on it or get out from that device. So the only one downfall of Motion iOS is the fact that it is um, a LAN connected service. It's not connected via the internet, but there is things that you can do to enable that. You can set up a VPN on your Raspberry Pi where you can tunnel in from your device and then look at your local cameras from there. I will be showing you how to set up a VPN on your Raspberry Pi in the coming episodes and I will show you how you can connect your docking containers from outside of your home. Please stay tuned for that. So finally, I just want to thank you all for your patience in waiting for new content to come up. With the move to the new office, it has taken longer than expected. Also that we have reached a thousand subscribers and I want to thank every single one of you for subscribing to our channel and making this channel what it is. So if you guys haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you are notified for any content that we upload. In the description box below, you'll find links to our blog post from today as well as affiliate links to all the hardware that we have used in today's tutorial. If you guys use any of them links, they are Amazon affiliate links and we do get a small bit of commission for each sale. Um, it comes at no extra cost to you and we do thank Thank you for using them. So that's it for today, guys. I'm so happy to be back and I look forward to the next episode and I'd like to thank you guys for watching.